Hi, I'm Bob Herbert. Welcome to Op-Ed.TV. It's the oldest weekly magazine in America. Its list of contributors is beyond distinguished. It includes Albert Einstein, Henry James, W.E.B. Du Bois, James Baldwin, Howard Zinn, Noam Chomsky, and Toni Morrison. It fought against the Red Scare of the 1950s, and it's fighting against Islamophobia today. It was founded by abolitionists in 1865 and remains a cultural treasure. I'm talking about The Nation magazine, which is celebrating its 150th anniversary this year. And I'm honored to have with us its editor and publisher and one of America's true progressive leaders, Katrina Vanden Heuvel. Katrina, Thank how are you? Thank you. Good Bob. to have you here. So First, congratulations, 150 years, <laughs> holy cow. Abe Lincoln was, was it's president. Quite, it's uh, quite a marker. You know, um, you started with the magazine as an intern mm -hmm. back in the 1980s, I think. So you've had quite a, a, a rise. Can you just, um, let's start by talking a little bit about how the magazine has changed since you went there. Since I went there. I did begin as an intern in 1980. Um, the internship program, by the way, is, um, has spawned 800 to 1,000 journalists who <laughs> fill the mainstream and sort of a guerrilla army. I came during the Reagan revolution. I came in, uh, during a moment uh, where we were witnessing the rollback of fundamental rights. And the nation, as you said, was founded by abolitionists, mm -hmm. committed to ending slavery, and more broadly, to fulfilling this idea, which has been at the heart of America, of a more perfect union, and has been committed to rights and liberties and the contested nature of freedom for many years. But I came into a moment where um, Central America, for example, was a central focus. Right. And I think of the arc of continuity. In the last days, the new pope has beatified Archbishop Oscar Romero, Isn't that something? who in those years was called by many in the Reagan administration and those around that administration a subversive, a he was communist. He was supposed to be the villain, now he he's the saint. He was supposed to be the villain, and I think part of what the nation, why the nation has survived, and this is, I hope, an answer to your question, is we call it like it is, and at that time we were doing a lot of reporting on Central America and reporting on the insurgencies, the movements, the liberation movements, liberation theology, and we were called names, as were others who spoke about a different future in Latin America, different than the military juntas or the coups. And we were called, you know, communists. <laughs> we were called subversives. Right. And we spoke, we believed, for international law, not bombing the harbors in Nicaragua, not subverting legitimate governments through contra training. And today I think we see that what was considered perhaps heresy in that time is considered not only common sense, but is legitimized, is validated. So I think the lesson for the na from the nation is that you need to stand up at a different, at moments where you may be vilified, castigated, marginalized. It's very easy to police conformity in this country. But if you speak out and you do the kind of journalism that is rigorous, that is honest, that is truth-telling, that in the end you may see justification in the broader culture, in the mainstream culture, in the mainstream media. So we've gone from Ronald Reagan yeah. through the Clinton years. Uh, so I was, yeah. A couple, couple of, uh, almost a couple of terms of Barack Obama. So all is well, right? Well, let me just say that I was there, <laughs> let, me, let me just, I was there for the Clinton impeachment. And you know, what strikes me is, yes, it was a scandal. But think of the scandals that truly afflict this country, ones we see today. In 1999, we at The Nation wrote a tough editorial saying, do not repeal Glass-Steagall, which was a new <laughs> deal piece of legislation Sorry. trying to keep banking separate from investment. So now we we're said, in the Clinton years. The in Bill the Clinton, Clinton years. years. And we said, if this bill is repealed, we may well see a financial crisis. So that, to me, was the real scandal. Then you come into selection of a president. Mm -hmm. We saw the deformation oh. of the Supreme Court, the politicization, the banana republicization of a Supreme Court, the selection of George W. Bush. And Bob, for me, I think one of the most important moments of my time as editor was in after 9-11, trying to speak with a tone of humanity, um, seeking a just response to that 
crime, but not going to war. I think the fact that we are on a war on terror footing has deformed our liberties and rights. And then in the run-up to Iraq, opposing the Iraq war, again, was not a uh, recipe for popularity, either in right. Washington or in this country. And many liberals, that's where the nation also stands out. I was just going to say, many that's, liberals why, that's one of the reasons the so war. many Democrats support Exactly right. Yeah. And uh, Senator Edward Kennedy, who I knew a little once, said that vote against the authorization to go to war was perhaps his single most important vote in the Senate. But for the nation, we believed that preemptive war was a violation of American politics. We editorialized, we reported. Uh, we felt we were part of sort of the second, the, around the world, there were masses of people protesting. There was a movement against the war. In the end, the war commenced. I think it is one of the great debacles, foreign policy right. debacles. The costs of war, which you have documented, Bob, 300,000 plus veterans with brain injuries, yep. the costs, the trillions. But everyone then was for it. And then a decade later, again, in the nation tradition, it's a disaster. It's a disaster. Though now we see an interesting debate arise again in the 2016 debates because Jeb Bush, <laughs> faux pas or not, right. said that he would authorize the war today knowing what he did. But I think that was critical. And then moving into, um, we come on the 10th anniversary of Hurricane Katrina, New Orleans, which I think opened up the raw wounds. Again, it's not quite what we see in the streets around this country with the policing brutality, but we see this. We saw the structural racism mm -hmm. in Katrina. Election of Barack Obama. One thing we learned at the nation during the Clinton years was the mistake of electing a Democratic president, <laughs> sitting back, which we didn't do, and right. saying, "Oh, our problems are solved. Everything's going to be fine." The fact that Barack Obama really, you know, spoke of a movement. Yes, we can. We. I think led people, and after the experience of the Clinton years, to understand you needed to have movements in place. You needed to push. You needed to drive issues that might otherwise get neglected. It's going to take, you know, we could sit here for about three weeks and discuss the <laughs> Obama presidency. But I do think we're in a movement moment now. I think we're in a time when people are in motion around this country. Uh, there's an emerging majority, I'd argue, for a kind of an economic populist progressive agenda. Black Lives Matter climate change, the fight for 15 minimum yeah. wage, the fight against inequality, which I think is the crisis of our time, and how those movements come together and where they move and what the connection is to inside the system. Because I do believe in inside-outside politics, and I, I won't give up, though. I value W.E.B. Du Bois' great essay in The Nation's Special Issue, 1956, Why I Won't Vote. But I do think... Uh, these are moments where you vote and you understand that casting that vote is the first step. The next right. steps are tougher. I agree, and, and I think you make such an important point about the uh, need for a movement. I tell kids on college campuses that you need a movement no matter whether someone is on the right or on Absolutely. the left in, in, a, in a White House because uh, these conditions don't change without the energy and the strength yeah. and the power that comes from, from a movement, in, which takes us back to the beginning of the nation, the abolitionists, one of the great movements uh, in this country. So talk about that a little bit. So how is it that the abolitionists came to found a magazine like The Nation? What was the point at the time? That, you know, it was understanding that at the end of the Civil War, also, it was founded at the end of the Civil War, but mm -hmm. these men, mostly men, one of them, by the way, the architect of Central Park, Frederick Law Olmsted, understood the value of ideas, because we're, they were journalists, they were writers, but they also understood that journalism is a form of organizing because you're organizing the way people think. And if you can change the way people think, you can change the way a politics moves. They knew the fights that would follow, for example, Reconstruction, mm -hmm. would be ferocious. And the nation, and I'm not going to uh, whitewash this. The nation at first was very committed to Reconstruction, which is our editorial board member, Eric Foner, the great history of Reconstruction, reminds us, was far more than it was understood at the time. And it was depicted too quickly as, you know, the carpetbaggers of the North coming to right. the South, when in fact it was a great fight over citizenship, democracy, voting rights, property, power. But I think the abolitionist founders valued honest reporting, critical thinking, dissent, and also <laughs> cultural 
thinking. One of the great pieces in here, if you can believe it, is a 22-year-old Henry James who wrote 60-plus essays for the nation, having the temerity to criticize Walt Whitman's drum taps. <laughs> so you had a great cultural arena as well as the sense of a magazine driving again to perfect rights and freedoms, which the founders, and I think we know, are always under stress, always contested. A 22-year-old Henry James? James. I always thought Henry James was born middle-aged. Middle-aged, <laughs> right. The, um, he even covered the racetrack for us. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you talk about um, the importance of ideas yeah. to the original founders of the nation, but, um, and I'm just actually going to read from this. In the first issue, this is a quote, um, the editors referred to, quote, the great strife between the few and the many, between privilege and equality, between law and power. That, they can be talking that today. about today, that, e exactly. There is a great relevance and resonance um, in what was written then. There were obviously discontinuities, but the great continuity is what you just quoted, understanding that that strife, that fight goes on. Um, and they also, the founders, two or three, they also understood that they were publishing not to make a profit, but to make a difference. <laughs> right. And also the belief that if you not so much believe in political parties or factions, but if you believe in telling the truth and what that can change, and tell people the truth, what that can lead to. So there was a belief in that as well. And that was fairly radical in its way mm. um, because so many of these I think publications were tied more tied to parties were more tied to crusades it is the case that the founder of the founding editor was very committed to fighting Tammany Hall the m emblem of corruption in those years so very committed to fighting graft but the other long strand the con real continuous strand through the nation's history is anti-imperialism which one of the writers in the special issue, Rollo Ogden, compares to, you know, he says anti-imperialism is as, as American as, you know, apple pie. And I'm not sure that's the case, hmm. but um, through the Spanish-American War, through World War I, uh, you know, into Vietnam, which, again, talking heresy, in 1954, Bernard Fall, one of the great right. writers about Vietnam, suggested maybe a negotiated settlement might be the way to go as opposed to military intervention. You guys were so early in the opposition to the Vietnam War. As early as 1963, we had advisors going over yes, there, or yeah. so-called advisors, and you were all, already waving, waving the caution flags. Uh, you know. I think it's, that, it's in the DNA. I, I come back to that long strand of any imperialism mm -hmm. any interventionism um, not pacifism, though we have writers, Norman Thomas, who was the presidential candidate in right. 1932 on the Socialist Party ticket. The nation endorsed him, by the way, in 1932. We have the power to endorse. We are a for-profit, having made a profit for a few years of the 150. <laughs> but in the subsequent three terms, we endorse Franklin Delano Roosevelt. But Norman Thomas writes about being a pacifist. And one of the editors, Oswald Garrison Villard, was a deep pacifist, committed not to entering World War I, and parted bitterly with the first woman editor of the nation, Frida Kirchway, who really became a s powerful proponent of su supporting the anti-fascist cause in World War II. There's been a uh, long tradition of radicalism in the yeah. United States. There, the, it would seem that from one era to another, there were always radicals out there, you know, making noise, getting people's attention, uh, and very often shaping the yes. dialogue. Um, that seems that that seems to have passed. Are there are, are there radicals out there today? Yes, you, I can yes, tell, I can tell yes. by your expression. She's coming yeah, back. Yeah, yes. Uh, who are who are today's radicals? Well, first of all, I think the center of gravity in the last few years has shifted. Has shifted, no question. And I think it's interesting. A recent poll shows that uh, a, you know many young people. I think it's thirty, forty percent are interested in what democratic socialism means. Um, I do think that our history, and the nation again reflects this, is more radical than many understand. You can retrieve in, the nation, in, the, in our history radical ideas which today might seem off the wall. I don't know, a state bank. We should retrieve the idea of a state bank. We should retrieve the idea perhaps of making 
some of these telecommunications companies, public utilities. But I See, do you're, think... you're talking like a radical. I'm well, waiting at, for the other Bernie, voices. But look at Bernie radical. Sanders. Bernie is mainstream. He's a United States senator. I like Bernie Sanders a lot, but he's main... He, 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 Elizabeth free Warren, educa- Bernie Sanders. All right, but free, edu- Bernie free Sanders. higher education, these are on the pathway to a different kind of America. Okay. I do think what we're missing is the full range of political voices and parties. We've never had it in this country fully because we've been impoverished. We are a right. two mainstream parties. Look at Europe. At The Nation, we've been covering the rise of leftist parties. Right. Podemos, the Spanish party, we did a very good piece in January, Can Podemos Win? It is the leading party in Spain today. There are two radical women just became mayor, one in Barcelona, one in Madrid. But I would say that there is a possibility now of more radicalism. I see it in a younger generation um, around the nation in their 20s, but also, um, you know, in some of these smaller publications like Jacobin. But I think there is a radicalism afoot. Listen, we've come out, we were, began by talking about the Reagan revolution. You know as well as I do, you've written about it for decades. The rollback, and Bill Greider has a piece in the issue, rolling back the 20th century. We have witnessed a rolling back. I agree. Of rights the and voting thoughts, rights act. liberalism, progressivism, radicalism. When did voting become a left-right issue? Mm-hmm. Um, the anti-tax movements I saw the other day, there's hope, the momentum to repeal Prop 13, the original sin in California. But Reagan did a lot of damage to this country, and it wasn't just Reagan, it's Reaganism. So we need to think anew, and part of what I write about in my introduction is we are in the fight of our lives for corporate control of our country, of corporate power, but I would also take solace in that people are waking up and understanding, and left-right, transpartisan, that the system is rigged. So let's talk a little bit about what it's like to be at the helm of a great yeah. magazine like this. So what's a typical day like for Katrina Vanden Heuvel? A typical day. Um, you know, we decide this week, for example, let me give you this week, it was a debate between looking at the Trans-Pacific Partnership Trade Agreement and weighing in, <laughs> right. which we have. I mean, in 1993, we did a special issue on NAFTA, that trade agreement. So there's, again, a history. So would we, you know, what, Another what are we going to Another case of where the liberals were, like, yeah. absolutely on point and ridiculed, and, right. and now it's, we're seeing yeah. the consequences. And I would say there's even more opposition and organized and better organized now, and more allies inside opposed inside the system. And then there was Ireland. I mean, oh. see, part of my role as editor is how do you balance the critique, which we're good at. My sister sometimes, she, she reads a magazine called Yes! Exclamation point, And she said sometimes her friends think of the nation as no. <laughs> and my mission is to at least get to maybe. And Ireland is a sense of people coming together to fight for equality, to enact equality, and to say to a system in a church, Anyway, so that the debate was between those two. So what we did was we <laughs> killed or postponed something to run both. So they're good, you know, because I think both are important. And then I mean, know, just yeah. on the on the Ireland issue for an, an old Catholic school kid, if you had said in the midst of the nuns yeah. and the priests I and know. my classmates and stuff that there would come a time in our Ireland. lifetime when Ireland would okay gay marriage, I think everybody would have just keeled over. And it's a great. I mean, I also value taking lessons from how that happened as an editor, as in someone who cares about organizing and the new social media allied with people coming together and principles and and all, 20 years ago they I think they barely supported the right for, to divorce. Is anyway, it, right. so, but we have a special issue this week which is about techno-utopia, oh. raising fundamental questions about all of this new technology, the sharing economy, and this is part of the nation's role, not to be so rah-rah and boosterish, but to look hard at what this means for working people, for democracy, you know, thinking hard about it. So, those, so th- th- that's unusual, but every week there is a kind of strategic, intellectual, political decision-making about what we want to comment on, what we want to weigh in on, what we can make a difference. And we're, you know, people say you're speaking to the converted. Well, I would say that our enemies read us, that um, we have a constituency reading us and trying to, you know, get some guidance for how to think about things. That's the main 
role I see. We're not a magazine of news. We're not a news magazine. We're a magazine of views, of analysis, of um, And even thought. the converted have to be properly informed. I think, it, yeah. It, and know. there are a lot of, you know, I find, um, you know, there, and, and you can't know everything about every, you know, no one can. But what you can do is bring around you some of the great minds and interesting thinkers and writers with verve. I take great, I, I love in the special issue and when we can, finding great literary voices to write about the right. times. Arthur Miller has an open letter to Newt Gingrich, the playwright. <laughs> Toni Morrison has a beautiful essay in the special issue on the role of writers in a time of fear and dread. Toni Kushner, the playwright, beautiful essay in 1994 on gay liberation, arguing yes for marriage and against discrimination, but what's the liberatory project here? You know, mm -hmm. how do we think in a more radical way? It was called the socialism of the skin. Mm -hmm. Edgar Doctorow, beautiful essay on the environmental apocalypse. So I just think those voices are also important because people want to, um, you know, to read a writing that is, lifts you up and takes you outside. You mentioned some of the movements that are going on now. So um, the Black Lives yes. Matter uh, movement, the the fight uh, among low wage workers um, that has been growing and, and seems to be uh, sustained. The fact that we're talking a, a great deal about inequality now, wealth and income inequality. Um, how hopeful does this make you? We've been through yeah. a pretty tough period, an extended tough period of time. Are you? Um, Optimistic, and if so, why? I suspect that you are, but tell us why. I'm optimistic, uh, though, as again, I come back to the, the larger forces arrayed are pretty brutal. I mean, the architects of reaction, the forces of money, you've written and thought a lot about this, are at a scale which might make the first Gilded Age seem <laughs> manageable. So that I put there. But I also see sweet victories, as I call them, each week. I mean, Black Lives Matter, and I'm reminded of James Baldwin's 1966 piece in this issue on report from occupied territory Harlem where he talks about the structural racism, the stop and frisk abuses. Right. I think that's the beginning of um, an awareness of the policing abuses, but it also links clearly to structural racism. And I think hopeful is the awareness and what to, is to be done, but of the threat mass incarceration has posed to our society. I'm hopeful because I think there are more and more people um, who understand something must be done and organized people over time in our history have made a difference and movements can shape it. I also believe you're seeing, again, I come back, I say in the introduction that if I have sort of fixed points along the compass, my beliefs, is you need that inside-outside strategy. <laughs> there was a debate in the last months because of the film Selma, right? King, Johnson, responsibility for the Voting Rights Act. I take, you know, I take solace that there are mayors now across this country who are supporting the agenda of $15 minimum wage, of the fast food workers, of, um, of workers. Um, Elizabeth Warren, of course, is a beacon but there are other senators, and there's a progressive caucus with 89 people who are supportive of what I might call the nation agenda. Mayor Bill de Blasio in New York City is just one of a number of mayors. The one, mayor, next mayor of Philadelphia is likely to be right. someone who could be this new bar of mayors lifting up issues. It's a long fight. I will quote, paraphrase Norman Thomas, who once said he is not a champion of lost causes. He's a <laughs> champion of causes not yet won, and that's where I place the nation and place myself. Katrina Van Hoople, this has been a, um, a real treat. I wish we had more time. Congratulations again on the 150th anniversary of The Nation Thank magazine. Uh, we'll be back in a moment with a final word. There's a section in the 150th anniversary edition of The Nation called Radical Futures. And one of the articles in that section, by John Wiener, argues that tuition at public colleges and universities ought to be free. I couldn't agree more. 
Why should our young men and women be saddled like pack horses with debt loads that can take close to a lifetime to pay off just because they want and need a decent education? College is free in a number of countries in Europe, including Sweden, Denmark, Finland, and Germany. So those who say free tuition is an impossibility remind me of the folks who said gay marriage could never happen or that Americans would never elect a black president. As the Nation article says, education is a public good. Those are our children who need that education, and all of us benefit from it. We, the public, all of us, ought to be paying for it. That's all for now. See you next time.